I want to open up the session for talking about how we can reduce the carbon footprint of energy, both strategies and potential. And we've got three, three great speakers here this afternoon. Um, the, the program is the same as, as I think in the morning. So we're going to, each speaker is going to speak for about 20 minutes and then we're going to have a half hour of discussion. So if you've got questions, hold them till the end and then we'll try and sort of have a good back and forth. Um, but I want to turn things over first off to, to Chris Jones, who's a program director for Cool Climate Network at the University of California at Berkeley. Chris. Hi, everybody. Um, well, all right, uh, I am the program director of the Cool Climate Network and we develop a smart greenhouse gas management software for uh, businesses, for households, and for communities. We'll be talking about that today. Um, first of all, I'd like to start off with a little bit of background. Uh, in California, it's a pretty exciting time to be doing greenhouse gas mitigation and management. In California, we just set a 40% reduction target by 2030, and you're aware of. I, I, have to, I was repeating that to myself this morning in bed, 40% by 2030. Um, it's extremely aggressive, and I'm gonna show you uh, it throughout the course of some slides why I think that's actually um, gonna be very, very difficult for us to meet. And we can start by just looking at this first study uh, our lab did, uh, this is Professor Dan Kamen's lab, and my program is part of his lab, uh, with uh, researchers from Lawrence Berkeley Lab, looking at what it would take, uh, kind of a, a back casting effort, what it would take to get 80% reduction uh, by 2050. And we have to do some pretty aggressive things. Um, in our model, and this is very consistent with some of the other models, also m several of them produced uh, in coordination with uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab and others, UC Davis as well. Uh, we assumed we'd need a 43% reduction uh, from efficiency alone, so that's efficiency in buildings across the board, transportation, agriculture, industry, 43% reduction. That is about a, um, it's about a, I think it was about a two and a half to three percent, something like that, uh, improvement in efficiency annually, whereas now we're getting a one percent improvement in efficiency kind of across the board. In transportation, we're doing a lot better, as you know. But uh, this new 2030 uh, target, I was just um, estimating right now, uh, as uh, the previous speaker uh, was up here, uh, it's actually a four percent per year improvement a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from now until 2030 across the board. That's what we're looking at in order to meet this target. It's extremely aggressive. Uh, frankly, I, I think this is really this target was really important politically to set a very very aggressive target. It's going to be very very difficult to meet. So. Um, as uh, Eric is going to be telling us a little bit later, uh, improvements, that level of improvement in efficiency, uh, there's a wide range of costs associated with that. And um, in my view, I think we probably set this efficiency level assumption a little too aggressive uh, before we do the next step, which is once you've done the efficiency, we want to have completely uh, renewable energy powering our grid by 2050. And if you are a household, uh, it's actually a lot easier for you to jump straight to renewable energy before you do a lot of those very, very costly uh, uh, energy efficiency improvements in your, in your building. And there's a point at which it's just a lot easier just to do the renewables than to do the efficiencies. So um, something to keep in mind. The next step, uh, consistent with all these studies, is electrification. We need to virtually electrify our entire uh, commercial and residential sectors by 2050 to have a chance of meeting this 80% reduction target. In addition to electrifying um, the range of studies between 50 and 80% of our complete vehicle fleet, and in the case of some of the studies, 100% of our light duty vehicle fleet electrifying by 2050. Extremely aggressive. Before we get into the benefits of uh, biofuels, biofuels were all, from there, reducing uh, another, um, uh, this is kind of progressively the emissions reductions that we're getting. Uh, another 35% of the remaining uh, from biofuels, those are mainly imported biofuels because we have a small water problem in California. And then uh, we calculated we could get about a 15% reduction from conservation. That's conservation that's not 
energy efficiency, uh, uh, this is reducing the amount of end use as opposed to producing that end use efficiency, efficiently. Very aggressive. Um, and this is what we need to do. But I added this slide just uh, a few minutes ago. And thinking about uh, adopt learning curves, uh, we have now, I kind of put some time frame on this. When we're developing our models, we um, have adoption curves. So we have a learning curve to bring down the prices, but then you need a lag time for the adoption curves. It takes time for people to adopt the technology, even when the cost, when the technology is cheap. Uh, and so the importance of behavior becomes very important. Um, we expected most of the improvements to take place in the 2030 to 2040 timeframe, giving a chance for those learning curves to bring the, the cost down and for policy to put, um, you know, to ramp up the adoption of this technology. So now we've got to dramatically shift over uh, all of these curves in order to have a chance of meeting that 40% reduction by 2030. Uh, it's going to be extremely difficult, and I'll be very interested later to hear Dan Sperling, his thoughts um, being on the uh, Air Resources Board Commissioner, how we can do this in the transportation sector. Um, just a, a point to follow up on that, we need to increase, uh, according to this model and some of the, some of the other models, increase our electricity uh, uh, consumption by about 50% if we electrify our heating and our, our vehicles. Uh, that's going to require uh, additional elect electric generation. So uh, how do we do this across all sectors? I think it's useful to think uh, about working at all of the different spheres of influence. Um, so individuals can work at the household level. They can work at their place of business, they can work at the community level, they can work uh, at the public policy level, and mostly we, we put most of our effort into the policy area. But uh, PV, uh, we were discussing this morning, is a good example where uh, it's really important to work at all scales. So these community uh, uh, community um, energy programs uh, that Ken talked about uh, earlier uh, this morning, um, we've had about a half a million, I think 500,000 different solar uh, projects in California alone uh, to date. That didn't come just from uh, policy and incentives. That came from massive community scale organizing and a lot of uh, city uh, level policy as well. So we really need to think about how do we uh, engage at all these levels. Um, so a little bit of uh, background on my work. This is the f kind of the first thing I, I did um, back in 2005 was to calculate the carbon footprint of the average household. Oh, and by the way, in my talk, I'm going to be talking about all scales here today. I'm starting at the individual level. So this is the carbon footprint of the typical US household. I was surprised in 2005 no one had actually calculated this yet. Um, and there may be some, some surprises here. I was surprised uh, to see that most of the emissions uh, are uh, embodied in goods and services that, that, uh, that households consume, not just not the direct energy which is and emissions which is about a third. Two thirds of, is about, of it is uh, embodied in, in electricity but also the other goods and services. Um, so there may be some surprises there for you. Food tends to surprise people how big of emissions contributor it is uh, to some people. Um, so here is the average uh, global household carbon footprint. So from here to here, that's an 80% reduction. That's roughly what California's goal is by 2050. Now let's imagine when we finally get to this level in the United States, not just California, but the entire US, we will have to get to here at some point. We will have only reached the global average. Globally, we need to reduce 80% below that in order to stabilize the climate, as you all know. So here's the US, uh, here is California. Uh, Higher emissions from transportation. Electricity is only 5% of the carbon footprint of a typical California household, only 5%. Now, a lot of people, I ask them what percentage they think it is of their carbon footprint, and I usually get a range anywhere from 10 to 80%, because that's what people hear. There's a billion dollars that goes into energy efficiency in California. People hear a lot about energy efficiency, and particularly electricity in their homes. It's actually a small part of the carbon footprint in California. Not the case if you live in, what do we have here, St. Louis, uh, and other parts of the country that are powered by coal. Electricity can be a big part of the problem. So we have this online calculator, and the students uh, at Berkeley um, are really proud when they use our calculator, and they come up with a carbon footprint like this. Uh, this is a 
typical one-person household in California that earns $10,000 per year. Basically, students are poor, and that's what's, what's going on here. But then, you know, they go out and they get married, and they get a job, and then they have a kid, and they have another kid. Maybe they move to St. Louis, right? And their carbon footprint goes up. So I really like, enjoy working with students before they make all these choices. So here's our online tool. It's a smart greenhouse gas calculator. And we, there's several things we mean by that. But one of the most important things is just benchmarking. So you put in your location. In this case, uh, this is where the students live. Or you could put in where the professors live, which is uh, down, down the, the, another uh, area zip code there. And then you can go in through and use the tool. So it, it, you put in your zip code and then the uh, income and the household size. And it gives you kind of a smart default. And we do the same thing for businesses, and we do the same thing for communities as well. You just put in the name of your city, and we give you the carbon footprint of your city, and we give you uh, greenhouse gas mitigation options, and what the costs and what the benefits of those would be. So here's our household calculator. Oh, and you go through and you get comparative feedback. So this household gets a smiley face. Actually, it's an angel face, I think, in this particular case. You can also get a crying face, which uh, my boss gets when he adds his flights in. <laughs> Dan Cameron, sorry. I had to Chavvy with that one, as I uh, do as well, if we calculate our flights. And then you can get to the end of this, uh, and, um, and it calculates your greenhouse gas savings and uh, the cost of those, the payback period. We do the same thing for businesses. So here's the carbon footprint of a typical school, and we've selected some of the mitigation measures, uh, measures that they can take. And uh, you can calculate kind of a marginal abatement curve if you wanted, which we've done in some of our papers. Question is, does individual, does information uh, change behavior? So we've had these tools out there for uh, over 10 years now. Are they changing behavior? Um, now, information can change behavior in specific cases to the extent that people find the tool, to the extent that it tells them something they don't already know about some action they're about to take. And this is where nudging comes in, you know, um, getting people at the right moment to change their behavior. But really, we found that the tool alone is not enough. And we've had to develop programs that kind of were investigating the use of community scale programs to kind of work across household businesses and community scale, and using a lot of uh, tools that we have in our kind of pocket uh, from behavioral sciences. I'm also the program chair of the Be Behavior, Energy, and Climate Change Conference. How do we engage communities? and to reduce barriers and increase the motivations of individuals to engage in these issues. We've had quite a bit of success. Um, this program, three years ago, engaged uh, uh, 10 cities across California. Uh, the next year, uh, we engaged um, another 10 cities. And last year, we engaged 22 cities in California. Um, and here's some of the tools um, that we have in our our toolkit. Uh, this is a paper I wrote with uh, Ed Vine about kind of why competitions work. Uh, it's comparative feedback that's very helpful. It provides normative information about what people uh, are doing, but more importantly, how they, um, the types of uh, behaviors that are expected from your community. Uh, we, we have social diffusion through the social networks within that community. We have collaboration and competition, collaboration within your community and competition between communities. We have incentives, gamification, we make it visible. And we really work on self-efficacy and that's something very important is that by working together, people kind of increase their belief and their ability to create a positive change in their community. We were able to, to get 14% change uh, reduction in electricity against a control group in this first year of the program. And then here's the winning city. We give them this nice award. And we experimented in the next year with uh, funding from Energy Upgrade California to offer a nice check to the city. And that did increase participation. At least our program got better, and we increased some participation rates second year. And then the third year, we got even more money. But it turns out that um, money is actually not what motivates individual behavior. I'm going to talk about that here. We, we found when we asked, well, first of all, when we did this, the, before we did the competition, we thought, what's going to motivate people? Oh, uh, earning prizes and, uh, for themselves and recognition for their community. That's what's going to motivate people to change their behavior. Dead last on the uh, list of, uh, recommend, of reasons why people participate in the program across all demographics, across political orientation, across cities, it was always the same story. Helping their community be a better place to live, helping the environment, helping organizations they care about. 
This is the space making your community a better place that really uh, resonates people across political spectrums. They all want to make their community a better place to live. And so uh, by using kind of these tools in our toolkit, we can encourage behavior and, and increase the adoption of these technologies uh, at scale. And, and that's really important. We can't, it's not simply a matter of making the technology available at cost, at low cost. We've got to somehow be able to use behavioral sciences to scale up the adoption of these technologies and practices. We ran a similar program uh, for uh, 10 University of California campuses. Last year, we got 20,000 staff, student, and faculty to participate. That's 5% of all UC um, campus, campuses. We had over 100,000 stories they submitted of things they do. People really want to share. Everybody does something. And over 25,000 photos of people sharing what they do. Now, you can't engage millennials without um, having selfies, right? So we, we encourage that. Take a selfie with you and your friends. Here's uh, some friends who are starting to uh, commute to school together. Here's another group. Uh, we try to promote them on Facebook as well, sharing these stories. Um, Selfies all over the place. The, kids, the students really, really uh, like that particular part of it. And it really makes it real and helps resonate with people as well. So um, shifting over now uh, in the last part of my talk, which is really why I'm here today, is to talk about community uh, scale greenhouse gas management and what are some of the uh, largest opportunities and how those might vary from community to community. So uh, we did a study in. Uh, in uh, 2014, this actually research goes way back though, um, we've been doing this about 10 years, uh, looking at the carbon footprint of every zip code uh, in the United States, and you can break this down. All of the ways in which I broke down the carbon footprint earlier, you can break this down by zip code. Now we don't actually know consumption of food and goods and services at that level of resolution, uh, but we do know a lot about uh, neighborhoods, uh, zip codes, and actually we're now down to the census block group level. Uh, we know how many vehicles people own, how they commute to work, uh, the structure of their home, demographic information, and we use that to construct econometric models to predict consumption and then apply appropriate greenhouse gas emission factors. So some of the things we found is that if you look at any uh, metropolitan area across the United States, you have this very similar pattern of uh, this is emissions per household. So you have very low carbon footprint uh, urban cores surrounded by these uh, kind of sprawling uh, metropolitan uh, metropolises and uh, with red carbon footprints higher in the suburbs. You kind of zoom in, here's New York City, it's kind of uh, very green in all of New York. Um, and our most recent analysis is down to the uh, census block group level. Uh, this paper is in a preparation now, or it's in review. Um, and so some Interesting things come out of this analysis by looking at this fine level. First of all, going back to the previous study, we calculated the carbon footprint of every city and every county and every state. You can compare them. You see some pretty big differences of which opportunities uh, present the largest uh, reduction opportunities, um, which areas present the largest opportunity. Uh, in the Bay Area, for example, um, let's just break this down and look at uh, transportation, uh, we find some neighborhoods have seven times higher uh, transportation-related emissions than other, other neighborhoods. So even within the same city, you can look at downtown, uh, um, some areas of, of Oakland or in Emeryville that are extremely low uh, uh, vehicle ownership and emissions related to uh, air travel and go to other areas of just within the same city. So if you're a community planner, we not, need not just this one average number for your community, you really need to think about how to engage different communities. You need different tools uh, to engage uh, different communities on, on these issues. Or maybe if you're you know, not focused on transportation, in uh, the urban core of Oakland, because that's actually not where the largest source of emissions are. It's actually food. Food is a larger source of emissions than, uh, than transportation. So we can compare all the cities. Um, so this next, um, and forgive me because this is not a paper yet. Um, this has been the project I've been working on for about the last year. As uh, you can see clearly a spreadsheet uh, on my computer. Uh, now we, we try to create smart decision-making software. This will be software eventually. Um, but what we've done is, is we have uh, have the carbon footprint of every city in California, we can scale, scale this to the entire US. We have uh, a series of policy areas. Uh, we have uh, 
30 different policy areas. And within each of those policy areas, we have individual policies. And this includes um, every aspect of carbon footprints. So the first thing that we can do is we can move people around in California to where the lowest carbon footprints are. We're scaling up the, over out to the year 2050. We have population estimates, and we can put that population where we want to in the model. And so we have on California um, uh, SB uh, 375, which um, encourages urban infill. And so we can actually look at uh, differences of urban infill versus uh, sprawl case. So that's one of the things we do is we move people around. Second thing we do is that we improve technology across the entire spectrum. Transportation, energy, uh, both new and existing buildings, uh, improvements in um, uh, commercial, industrial, and agricultural efficiency. And then third thing we do is look at conservation behaviors. How can we reduce vehicle miles traveled, reduce consumption uh, of um, goods, and shift those towards local services, and have uh, lower and healthier diets? So here is... Um, the estimate for the state, if you just look at the right-hand side here, um, this is under business as usual going out to 2050. Uh, we have about 500 million uh, ton, metric tons of, of CO2. And under our business as usual case, um, because of population growth, growth, our changes in efficiency are basically going to offset population growth. So we've kind of stable emissions out to 2050. Um, and we can apply uh, a series of scenarios to look at what it would take to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to certain levels. So something to keep in mind from the consumption perspective is a lot of our emissions, think of it from a household, are not within your control. Same thing within California. A lot of our emissions are exported uh, globally. And so um, it is much more difficult to reduce our carbon footprint on a consumption basis. And using roughly the same estimates we did on the production side to get to an 80% reduction, I was only able to get to a 50% reduction on the uh, consumption side. So not true, however. Um, where you live really matters. So uh, in Bakersfield, where the population is basically going to double, um, you have much less reduction opportunity. If you live, happen to live in a city that's reducing its population, is the city of Bishop, um, you, know, you can get a lot steeper reductions. And so cities really need to set uh, regionally appropriate targets, and probably a uh, per capita target makes the most sense. Let me just um, conclude with some of the major lessons we've had of this work. Um, Greenhouse gas reduction opportunities, they vary widely by location, demographic information, and sector. Behavior change can be effective at scale. That uh, program in, at, at, between the University of California campuses saved a million dollars of energy for $100,000 in cost, only in its pilot stage. Local governments should really consider incorporating consumption-based greenhouse gas inventories. We can provide that to all cities now, and they, uh, many of them are starting to do that. New York City, San Francisco, many others. Um, 80% reduction from consumption is not possible. Another important thing here to consider is that in 2050, we need completely renewable energy powering our economy. The benefit of urban infill, the benefit of energy efficiency is much, and the benefit of adding new PV is much, re much reduced. So the mix of strategies is much broader if you have a short-term target than a long-term target. Food becomes the largest source of emissions over time. We gotta worry about that. Um, and um, we really need to think about how to completely electrify uh, our economy and base it on renewable energy. Those are all the points I could make with this study, um, but I certainly welcome any comments you may have. And here's a bunch of papers that are available if you're interested. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. I want to turn things over now to, to Mike Tomlin from the World Bank, who's a head of their energy environment group. He's going to talk about sort of the international side, international cooperation, and technology uh, innovation. So, Mike, over to you. Thank you. I want to thank Madhu especially for inviting me to be here. This has been a very, very interesting and rewarding conference to attend, so thank you all. I want to draw your attention to the words at the bottom. Um, the official position of the World Bank is that it doesn't take positions on international negotiations. That's the work of the so-called Conference of Parties, and we stand ready to serve that process. 
Um, I'll be taking a somewhat uh, dimmer view of what the current negotiation process looks like and what we might do instead, but that's only my opinion. I think I can go quickly through these key conclusions. Um, we're going to have to have a complete energy transformation, and it's going to have to start soon. This, has been, this point has been made by a number of other presenters. Maybe more debatable and controversial is that given the suite of options we have available today, there are some limits on what we can achieve uh, at acceptable costs. Acceptable is a loaded term, but I'll stand by it. What we need, I'll argue, is more international cooperation to develop, and here I mean invent and diffuse and have adopted, uh, more affordable low carbon energy options. Now, the backdrop on this, uh, well, I'll, I'll say these things, but uh, let me just point to the second one. We also have to worry about the fact that lower income countries have a very different set of priorities, at least in the uh, present time, than uh, wealthier countries have. And it's, I think, important uh, for a lot of reasons that we not impose significant costs on lower income countries to achieve this global public good. Now, the backdrop for this, as many of you may already know, is that since at least the early 1990s, uh, we've been having various kinds of climate change negotiations. They officially got going in 1995. The first targets were set in 1997. And the process has sort of moved along since then. But the process has never really generated something that inspired broad confidence in the ability to get deep emission reductions of the kind necessary to avoid dangerous climate change, to get them soon enough and to be able to effectively share in the costs of that. Most recently, last December, uh, the meeting in Paris agreed to a new kind of approach, so-called nationally determined contributions, or NDCs. These are basically pledges that individual countries make. They can make them in all different forms. They can pledge actions. They can pledge numbers. They can pledge, we'll do this, but if you give us money, we'll do a little more. It's a real hodgepodge of, of uh, different types of agreements. Now, the good news is that, at least ostensibly, these are things the countries themselves have come up with, though I know a little bit about how some of these were come up with, and I have my doubts about whether the countries will actually be able to or want to achieve them. But at least this isn't the zero-sum game of taking a, a pie of emissions and dividing it up and saying, whatever I get, you don't get. It's intended to be something that is uh, more compatible with individual national self-interests in a kind of narrower economic sense. Um, the bad news is that while if fully implemented, uh, the framework convention has indicated that it would achieve significant reductions. It might hold temperatures to as, much, as, as low as 2.7 degrees above pre-industrial levels. That's if it's fully achieved. And we have to get, according to the Paris meetings, below 2 degrees to really have avoided dangerous change. And one of the elementary principles we have in economics is that the marginal cost of going farther and farther into something gets higher and higher the farther you go. Some of you may have seen this figure. Uh, this is basically just a way of summarizing in a, in a uh, single chart that climate change is something to worry about, so I won't dwell on it. Um, yesterday's speaker didn't seem to be persuaded by this, but I certainly am. But I also want to emphasize that there are a lot of other things that matter, especially for developing countries. Particulate matter causes um, 3.7 million deaths a year from indoor air pollution and 4.3 million from ambient air pollution. I may have those figures reversed, but that's the scale according to the global burden of disease. Unsafe water and uh, inadequate sanitation are another major problem, and diseases are a problem as well. So we have to figure out how we're going to deal with the global problem while at the same time dealing with a lot of other important problems at the national level, especially for developing countries. Their priorities are they want access to affordable and clean energy for cooking to reduce indoor air pollution, to enhance their growth prospects with improved access to electricity. They want that electricity to be available in a reliable way. 
uh, and they want to find ways to do this without bankrupting their national governments, which is a big concern in a number of places. This shows simply that uh, we have a shift in emissions, relatively speaking, now toward the middle income countries and increasingly going into the future beyond the 2010 that this slide stops at, even lower income countries will start to become an increasingly important share of the total emissions bundle. There is a basic piece of algebra that I have a slide on, which I'm going to promptly skip, that says you, if you combine the population growth, the percentage growth in income per capita, the percentage growth in energy per unit income, and the percentage change in carbon per unit of energy, you can figure out how total greenhouse gases are going to grow. Now notice there was a small but discernible downward trend in the diamonds through the 1991-2000 um, decade, and then it popped back up. It popped back up partly because we had a lot of economic growth in the decade between 2001 and 10, even though we had a big recession in rich countries in 2008. And we also had energy uh, become more carbon intensive going from a net negative in the previous decade to a net positive. What this really reflects more than anything else is the rapid expansion of the Chinese economy, and that economy is primarily coal-based at this point. Now, an example. If population growth were 1% a year, which it certainly is not at this stage, and per capita income growth is 3%, which is way too low to reduce poverty, and you assumed that you could sustain 2% energy efficiency improvements per year, which, as Chris points out, is a very ambitious target, you would still need to decarbonize at the rate of 2% per year. A colleague of mine at the World Bank looked back at experience in this area, and he found only one time when we've ever achieved something on the order of a 4% total decarbonization, and that was when France introduced nuclear power and that was for a few years. So otherwise, these are very out there kinds of objectives. What we see here is that up until 2011, coal was dominant, gas was important oil, renewables were there, but uh, not growing as rapidly. And if we look at what the International Energy Agency says going out to 2035, this is about a three-year-old slide, so I think the renewables growth is probably smaller than it should be because EIA, I'm sorry, IEA also can be a bit conservative in some of their projections. But even so, the point remains that absent some major change, we're going to have a fossil-dominated energy system globally into the future, longer than we can really afford to have it if you're worried about the problem of global climate change. I think it was mentioned earlier today, maybe in the morning, that the uh, idea that as natural resource economists we used to work on, that physical scarcity will be a binding constraint on energy use, simply doesn't hold. There is so much coal around and we can do so many things with it to make it into useful energy that we can't rely on scarcity of physical scarcity alone to be a way out of this problem. Now, the next few charts are taken directly from the fifth assessment report that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change produced. For those of you that may not know about the IPCC, probably most of you do, but it's an international group of scientists, including social scientists, that get together every few years and take stock of knowledge. These charts were produced by a number of people involved in this process. They are primarily driven by large integrated assessment models, where you're modeling the climate system in a very simple way and you're modeling the economic system in a simple way, and you're asking, what would it uh, take to achieve different reductions? Now, we're just over 400 parts per million today, and if we wanted to achieve uh, between 430 and 480, sort of the 450 target, you can see that um, the uh, share of 
low carbon energy would have to grow 310% in the median of all the modeling cases run, a lot less if you're willing to tolerate a lot more global warming. But 580 to 720, many people would argue, is just too much in terms of avoiding dangerous climate change. Here are the cost numbers. Um, basically, if you start from the right and read to the left, you see that for the most ambitious targets, the median cost would be roughly 5% of consumption measured in a national income accounts kind of way. Now that's 5% of income, or rather consumption, in the year 2100. Consumption is going to be a lot bigger in 2100, we certainly hope. So on the one hand, it may seem like that's a fairly small percentage. And if you were willing to move to 550, the median would be below 2% loss. The thing is, while these are relatively small percentages, on a large base, these are still very, very large numbers. These are numbers that uh, you know, dwarf most of the debates we have in public policy about how we should spend money in the United States or just about any other country. More importantly, and I think this is often overlooked when these charts are, are read, these numbers are produced by simulation models that assume a globally cost-effective approach to emission reductions. It's as if we had the famous invisible hand creating prices for carbon emissions and coordinating them globally so that wherever there was a cheap ton to be reduced, it would be reduced. And if there was a more expensive ton, it would be left. That's obviously an enormously heroic assumption. There is, again, coming back to Chris's point, a very large energy efficiency wedge built into these models. I think it's on the order of about 40% of the carbon reduction comes from improved end use uh, and intermediate use efficiency. And there are some strong technological assumptions being made. Um, in particular, carbon capture and storage plays a huge role in these numbers. And if you look on the top of this chart, and you look at what happens to the cost if you don't have carbon capture and storage, you can see that for the blue bar, which is the more ambitious climate target, costs go up 150% of, of the base. Interestingly, nuclear in these runs doesn't seem to have been so important. So phasing out nuclear didn't seem to have such a large effect on the costs. But that could be an artifact of the models. I think the general point is that you have to be able to use, without public policy constraints, without uh, any other uh, issues of cost, public acceptability, or whatever, everything we've got in carbon reduction to get the numbers that I showed previously. And those numbers are not small. Now, I uh, would claim, and I'm happy to be proved wrong, because this would be a case when I'd love to be wrong, that we need significant further technical progress to move ahead toward the deep decarbonization, 80%, 85%, 90% within a realistic time frame. Uh, Professor Zilberman gave a terrific talk earlier about biofuels. Second generation or advanced first generation certainly show promise, but they're not going to be available in a year or two, uh, or even maybe five years. Um, I'll let him elaborate on that if he wants later. Fuel cells seem very promising. The hydrogen economy has been something we've hoped to see for a long time, but I don't think we're there yet for large-scale implementation, and it's not going to be next year or the year after. Wind and solar have inherent challenges, and that's been alluded to by a couple of speakers. Intermittency makes the system hard to manage if you have uh, large percentages of intermittent resources. Uh, storage is still very costly, though costs are coming down rapidly for it. And at least for some of these resources, photovoltaics and large wind farms, you're talking about taking up a lot of real estate. And that's a concern where you have high population densities. Thanks. Um, and so on. Now, the standard view in international agreements, to come back to where I was at the beginning, is that countries are going to get together and find agreements that solve the environmental problem, don't cost too much, are reasonably fair, and are feasible from an institutional point of view to achieve and to monitor. So countries get together, they have these agreements, maybe we're even lucky and they use price-based policies. 
The problem is, is that when you have these deep and costly cuts, it creates this free riding incentive. People want to shirk their responsibility. They'll either say, uh, we're going to do a lot, and then they don't, or they'll simply say, I'm not going to do very much. And people have tried for a couple of decades now to resolve this conundrum by saying, here's the fair and equitable way to distribute the responsibility. As far as I'm concerned, none of those prescriptions have really very much traction, unfortunately. So I come back to uh, the concept of a disruptive transformation, which I wrote long before I knew what the lunch speaker was going to talk about. We need lower costs for low carbon energy to be able to really cut deeply into what the carbon budget of the globe is right now. Carbon pricing and other policies, uh, renewable fuel and portfolio standards do offer, obviously, incentives for moving in the direction of innovating to achieve the policy goals as well as reducing emissions in and of themselves. But if we take this fairly incremental approach, there's a real open question about whether we'll get there fast enough. So what do we need in the way of resources? Um, OECD has estimated that we need something a lot higher than 15 billion, which was their estimate of energy R, D, and D. Um, it's been about 5% of total R, D, and D, at least up until fairly recently. It's dropped since 1980, when energy R and D was much more fashionable. And the IEA has decided that uh, we need about $45 trillion by 2050. And that's on top of building out the energy system to meet the growing demands. That's the additional cost needed to be able to achieve deep cuts in carbon emissions. Sums on the order of 0.2% of global GDP, which is sort of what we're talking about here, are going to be the province of governments. It's not something that the private sector can finance, even with the strongest of incentive or regulatory policies. And so basically, what I'm arguing is that we need to have a technology club, high middle income countries, advanced countries, anybody can join, but we need certain rules. The goal is to try to get uh, an order of magnitude or more increase in RD and D, the applied part as well, but in a way that provides for open access to the information. So the government funded or sometimes private funded innovation has to be done in a way that it's either cheap to license or free. Um, we can't uh, avoid knowledge spillovers. We, in fact, should be encouraging them in this case. We want these things to get out there quickly. And we want to encourage countries to do um, different things because we need a portfolio approach. This is where the Apollo analogy breaks down. We only wanted to do one thing with Apollo, send a little hunk of metal up in the air and get it to the moon. Here we want to do something, reduce emissions deeply, but we still don't know what the best route is, so let's try a lot of things. We'll waste a lot of money, but it's probably money worth wasting. The beginnings of this are here. as. Uh, Ken pointed out this morning, uh, there was this 20 country, there is this 20 country agreement to double R&D spending on clean energy. Uh, Bill Gates and other wealthy people have uh, come together. Uh, there was a proposal from uh, Lord Nicholas Stern and others to have this Apollo program, though they were actually asking for a much smaller fraction of GDP. And this did get support at the Paris climate meetings, even though there was mostly a focus on these sort of voluntary pledges. There is the beginnings of a movement in this direction. My point would be that I think this needs to be accelerated and accelerated quickly so that we can get over the next 10 years a very large amount of money. Now, can it be badly spent? Yes. Are big R&D programs hard to run? Yes. But I don't think that we solve the problem by saying, well, these are hard to do, therefore let's not do them. We have to try them and see what we can accomplish. I don't think we have to worry very much about making these things cheaper and then having rebound effects. That's a concern that some people have. What if, for example, the owners of oil start producing oil faster because it's going to be made economically obsolete sooner? I don't think that's a major problem. There are already limits on what oil producers can get for their resources. And finally, to make sure that the interests of developing countries are met, we need to make sure that what is being devoted to their needs, so-called carbon finance, has effects that are beneficial for development 
and not just for reducing climate change. And on that point, just one last thought. Um, many people like to count the improvements in air quality as a co-benefit of reducing emissions. And in a certain arithmetic sense, they are. But if we've already demonstrated that cutting local air pollution is so important to save lives, shouldn't we be doing it anyway? Why do we get to count it if we cut carbon, rather than saying to the people that aren't doing it, get on with it? And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. Now I'm very happy to turn things over to, to a colleague of mine, uh, Erica Myers, who does a lot of work on energy efficiency uh, and who's going to talk to us about how some, of, how some of these improvements, investments work. Thank you, Kathy. All right, so energy efficiency is often touted as one of the most cost-effective ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So this figure here is a demonstration of this concept. This was made by uh, McKinsey and Company, a consulting firm. And on the y-axis here, we have abatement costs in euros per ton of carbon abated. And on the y-axis, what you have is um, abatement potential listed from lowest cost to highest cost. Each one of the bars in this figure is a different particular measure uh, that could be taken to abate carbon. What I want you to notice about this figure is anything here that's below the x-axis, so everything sort of on the left part of this graph, the implication is that we can get these carbon reductions at negative cost. So in other words, um, there's energy efficiency investments that we can take up that are not only going to abate carbon, but they're going to save people money. Um, and so this is really attractive to policymakers, right? Policymakers want to do something about this global warming crisis, um, and this seems like a real win-win opportunity for them to do energy efficiency investments. Not only can they reduce carbon, they can save people money, and they don't have to impose costly taxes on people and other unpopular things like that. So here's just a few quotes um, from policymakers on energy efficiency. We have our former Secretary of Energy, Stephen Chu. Uh, for the next few decades, energy efficiency is one of the lowest cost options for reducing U.S. carbon emissions, many studies have concluded that energy efficiency can save both energy and money. Uh, President Obama, in his 2013 uh, State of the Union address, I'm also issuing a new goal for America. Let's cut in half the energy wasted by our homes and businesses over the next 20 years. Uh, and then our current Secretary of Energy, Ernie Moniz, is saying that energy efficiency is going to be the focal point of his time as secretary. And there's been big money spent on energy efficiency. So as an example, uh, part of the stimulus, uh, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, $97 billion went to energy-related funding, and $32 billion of that went to energy efficiency and retrofits. Um, a recent analysis by the Lawrence Berkeley Labs found that we spend over $5 billion annually of um, customer money on energy efficiency programs through utilities, and that's projected to almost double by 2025. In addition, um, Energy efficiency is a significant component of prominent greenhouse gas um, emissions reduction policies. So the EPA's Clean Power Plan, which would be the first um, national uh, program in the U.S. to reduce carbon emissions from the electricity sector, um, is projected to meet almost half of its emissions reductions from energy efficiency. So here I've got a, a graph from a blog from the ACEEE, American Council for an energy efficient economy. Um, the left hand y axis gives us the percent of the EPA uh, 2030 goal that can be met through energy efficiency. That's the yellow bar for each of these states. Um, and then the red bar is uh, read off of the y axis on the right hand side. That's billions of dollars saved um, through these measures. And basically, what this is projecting is many states can meet more than half of their emissions reduction uh, goals under the Clean Power Plan through energy efficiency, um, and it's going to save them money. Uh, the Massachusetts Global Warming Solutions Act of 2008 also projects that more than one-third of their reductions are going to come from energy efficiency improvements uh, to buildings and appliances. So here, um, this was an analysis done by the State Department of uh, Energy, and what they're doing is projecting for each year the benefits that they've had from their energy efficiency improvements. And these are largely coming from engineering models. So we know that we've, you know, installed um, 
X amount of uh, insulation in different homes, and so we're, we're projected to get this much savings from that. And they're projecting that they're getting um, hundreds of million dollars in savings from their energy efficiency investments. Um, almost 15% of uh, greenhouse gas em emissions from uh, California's AB32 is projected, projected to come from building and appliance efficiency programs. Um, so here we've got a pie chart um, where, of where these different emissions reductions are going to come from in uh, California's AB32. And you can see the energy efficiency and conservation um, at 15% there. So a really significant portion, almost as big as what they're expecting to get from their renewable energy standard or their low carbon fuel standards. Um, so how is this energy efficiency potential calculated when McKinsey is putting this uh, curve together? Well, generally, they're doing it by coming up with a difference in life cycle costs between standard and efficient appliances or standard and efficient uh, measures um, in a house. And so the life cycle cost has two components, the purchase and installation costs, and then the operating costs, which they sum over the lifetime of, of these measures. Um, and so generally, a more efficient appliance or, or measure is going to per perhaps cost more up front, but the idea is it could save you more money over the lifetime of the of the measure. So this has created um, a research agenda for economists, and it's not particularly new to this time period, but it's had a resurgence in interest with, with um, the emphasis on energy efficiency in dealing with um, climate change. And so the question is, why aren't these seemingly cost-effective measures being taken up in the absence of public policy? So why do we need to spend 90 billion, you know, 30 $32 billion of uh, stimulus money to get people to do something that would save them money already. Why aren't they doing it on their own? So the idea is if there's dollar bills on the ground, uh, why is no one picking them up? So I think sort of a, the initial push uh, recently on, on looking at this problem is we, as economists, we wanted to identify if there are any market failures that might lead to suboptimal investment. So is there something we can identify that's not functioning well right now um, in terms of how people are making decisions um, where perhaps we could have some type of intervention that would help with that. So are people not optimizing for themselves when they go to the store and they're trying to pick, out, pick out, for instance, a particular appliance? Is energy costs out of sight and out of mind for them? Are they being a bit myopic and thinking more about the upfront cost than um, the cost of an appliance over time? Is energy not salient enough? Are people paying more attention to the color of the appliance and how it looks? Um, is there a status quo bias? You know, people are more likely to continue to buy uh, incandescent light bulbs than buying more efficient CFLs or something like that. Um, or there could be other types of market failures like principal agent problems where in uh, apartment buildings and in, commercial, in the commercial sector, often the person who's making the decisions about the equipment in a building are not the same person that's paying the energy bills. And so sometimes um, they have different incentives that can lead to underinvestment and efficiency. So I would characterize the, this literature so far that you know people have looked into some of these market failures and they, they do exist and there are a few circumstances where they can be pretty big, but often they're relatively small. So it doesn't seem like people are making really poor choices when it comes to energy efficiency. Um, I think some some where the direction where this research is going is more that projected savings are typically overestimating realized savings when we come up with these uh, energy efficiency potential. So for instance, um, there was a recent evaluation done of the weatherization assistance program in the United States um, where we found that uh, realized savings uh, were much lower than projected savings. It's true in appliance rebate programs, both in the U.S. and Mexico. Uh, it's true for building codes um, and how much more efficient we expect these houses built under new codes to be relative to old homes. Um, so, so it's definitely true across federal programs. And so I think the new question is what is driving this wedge between uh, projected and realized savings? Um, and I think there's a real potential to do um, a lot of research in this area. So I would sort of break out different pieces of these wedges um, according to these three categories. Um, how much of this can we attribute to workmanship, right? So there's a lot of um, programs that are run by 
government agencies, those aren't or by utilities, they're not necessarily profit maximizing. Um, and so they don't necessarily have incentives in, in line to make sure that uh, every measure is done to the highest uh, potential. Um, occupant behavior, once people have these more efficient um, appliances in place, uh, maybe they use more energy. Um, you know, to what extent do, do the occupants have an effect? And then how much of this is just being driven by over um, ambitious modeling in terms of what we can get from energy efficiency? Um, so I think there's still a lot of room for work to be done here, but here's uh, one study that I've come across uh, looking at the effect of different workers. So this is looking at the weatherization assistance program in the Midwest, and what we have here is uh, net savings on the y-axis and average projected savings on the x-axis. So if we were exactly realizing the projected savings uh, with this program, you would expect to see the dots all along that 45 degree um, dark line there. And what you can see is, on average, we're getting much less than, than the projected savings, where each dot here is a particular worker, a particular auditor and inspector in the program. Um, so it seems like there could definitely be potential uh, if we could get everyone, to, seems to be one worker there that's close to the 100% line. Uh, maybe there's things we can do to affect worker incentives um, to improve them along that dimension, but it certainly doesn't appear to be the full story. Um, how about occupants? So some say that actual energy use has little to do with house efficiency uh, because the effects of particular occupants can have such a large effect. Um, so it can be hard to measure the effect of occupancy, but um, Blasnik in 2013 uh, did something to try to bracket it. So when you're thinking about, um, you know, how much of this energy efficiency modeling can we attribute to the particular house structure versus how the people who live in it behave? Um, and so what he decided to do is look at um, the difference in energy consumption between 2009 and 2012 in owner-occupied single-family homes where he's going to compare people that stayed in their homes, so you know you have the same occupants before and after, versus people that it moved. And so if, if people um, are having a much larger effect than the, the house and the structure itself and how they behave, then you'd expect to see huge differences in energy consumption for these movers as opposed to the people uh, that stayed. So here's what he found. Um, what we have here on the y-axis is the absolute uh, percent difference in gas usage, and then the y-axis is uh, the percentage of homes. Um, and the mean absolute change in gas use for mo movers was 15%, while, whereas it was 8% for the stayers. Um, but it seems like the structure itself um, is a pretty good predictor of how much energy consumption you have. So having a different person live in that house does not have a, a huge uh, difference in terms of energy consumption. We're, we're within 25%, um, or sorry, 71% of movers are within 25% of prior use, whereas it's 90% of stayers. Um, but it seems like if we can get the modeling right uh, in terms of the structure, we can get pretty close to um, projecting how much savings we can get from energy efficiency investments. So how about the modeling? It seems like uh, engineers do a pretty good job with newer efficient homes. So when we know that, that we're gonna have a Energy Star home built, uh, we do a pretty good job of predicting how much energy consumption we're gonna have in the first few years. Whereas energy consumption and the effect of energy efficiency improvements of the existing housing stock appears to be much, much harder to predict. And that's where I think we can benefit from having much more ex post evaluation um, of realized savings from measures um, and help calibrate models to increase the accuracy. So as an example um, of this new versus old effect, so here we've got uh, 720 Energy Star new homes um, in the Midwest. Again, we've got the actual energy consumption on the y-axis and projected on the x. So this 45 degree line is the black line here, and you can see um, with these models for newer homes, we do a pretty good job of estimating um, energy consumption. Uh, and this is for heat in the Midwest. Similarly, this is for uh, cooling in Houston, um, looking at energy star homes, and we can see 
you know, there's a huge variation, but um, the 45 degree line does a relatively good job of predicting uh, energy consumption. Um, whereas it's much, much more difficult with older homes. So here we've got um, an analysis of the Wisconsin Home Energy Rating System, uh, HERS study, and um, the line of perfect agreement, or that 45 degree line, is the line on the top here. And we can see that the regression fit is much uh, lower than that. So basically, we've badly overestimated um, energy consumption for if inefficient homes. So I've talked to a few engineers about this, and this seems like um, it can sometimes be systematic that we very much um, over predict how much energy consumption there is in these older homes. And so when we have these models and we say, uh, how much savings can we get from upgrading them, uh, that's going to lead to uh, an overestimate. Um, here's another example from California Home Energy Efficiency Rating Services, Cheers, 1997, um, where we have the energy consumption plotted against the overall rating according to the system. And it, as you can see, there's almost no relationship between the rating and actual energy use. Um, so it seems like there's real room for improvement there. Um, so just uh, some takeaways, I think that energy efficiency is here to stay in clim climate policy and utility programs. Um, but program goals can really be undermined if energy efficiency is not accounted for properly. So if we assume that we can get a lot of savings uh, for much cheaper than we're going to be able to do it, um, then we may be uh, designing policies based on a cost-benefit analysis um, where we have much fewer uh, benefits, or the costs are much higher uh, than we had previously thought. Um, I think there needs to be much more ex post analysis done uh, to compare projected to realized savings um, from energy efficiency measures. Um, and as more studies come out that estimate realized savings on a per measure basis, we can start to decompose the wedge uh, and try to better predict energy efficiency benefits for public policy. Thanks, sir. Yeah. Nicely done. So uh, I'm going to run around with microphones, but uh, l we have about, let's see, uh, at least a little over 20 minutes for, for Q&A. So if you hold up your hand, I'll, if flag me down, I'll hand you, a, hand you a microphone. This is for the folks recording in the back. So even if you project, please use one of these. Here, hold on. David, you can go second. Let me grab the guy behind you. Um, I have two sets of questions, but I'll just do one now and if there's time. So on this presentation on energy efficiency, I think I, I'm not deeply immersed in it, but it, it occurs to me that actually what you're asserting should be much narrower than kind of what you're implying, and that is, first of all, when you say energy efficiency, you're really talking about home building efficiency, um, nothing broader than that. And even within that, you're not talking about appliances or equipment or lighting. I think what you're just talking about is um, retrofitting or doing things to existing older homes. Um, is that right? Because if I talk about energy, so like in energy transportation, when I talk about energy efficiency, we have a huge success story. When I think about lighting, I think there's a huge success story. When I think about appliances, I think there's a huge success story. So you're just taking one piece of it, and I'm not even sure how to characterize how big a piece it is, but it seems misleading in any case. Go for it. Can you go back on the answer? Yeah, so I think I've certainly been focused more on building efficiency. Uh, for this talk, but I, there are, and the evidence that I have is pretty limited, and I think there needs to be a lot more research done um, in terms of the projected versus realized savings. So the evidence I showed you was more from these weatherization and retrofits. Uh, but there have been studies done in economics that have been looking at appliance rebate programs and looking at uh, installing more energy efficient appliances, and then the result of 
the resulting uh, energy reductions from that. And um, they're also finding this gap between projected and realized savings in the appliance world. Um, let's see, also in terms of building codes, when we project and we build new homes under these more restrictive standards, um, how much energy is going to be saved, it seems to be much lower than uh, is predicted ex ante. So it doesn't, um, I'm, yeah, I'm not just familiar with like the transportation sector, but I think in the residential sector, it's not just to retrofits and weatherization, it's also new appliances, new homes um, under building codes are finding similar things. Maybe I'll respond because I have a couple of thoughts. Um, uh, I think the, the benefit uh, of architecture and buildings uh, really varies pretty dramatically. So in California, only about a, a third, uh, we're, we're going to increase our population by 30%. Uh, that means of the population of building stock in 2050, only 25% will be new buildings. And so really, it's the existing buildings. However, in the Central Valley, they're going to almost double the population. And so in certain areas, um, we really have a, a lot of potential for, for urban infill, uh, and uh, particularly how those buildings, particularly multifamily uh, uh, units. The new homes are very, very efficient right now. So it's, it's, it's a matter of kind of scaling down the size of, of, of buildings and locating them where the, uh, they have lower transportation costs. It's about the full life cycle. And also, uh, in terms of, um, I absolutely agree, in terms of getting the expertise to uh, know how to manage systems. Uh, in the energy efficiency world, if you go to a utility, they don't focus on residential. Uh, it's all of the vast majority of their technicians are, are on, on commercial industrial buildings where commissioning of buildings, recommissioning, retro commission of buildings can have big savings and where you get the technique technician in one uh, but what do we do with uh, you know uh, the residential sector? It's it's very very difficult to um, get those types of efficiency improvements. I don't know, just some thoughts. 
Yeah. Great. My question is also for, for Chris. Thanks. Oh, okay. uh, really, really nice talk. And um, <clears throat> I really was intrigued by some of your discussion and slides about motivations or, or mechanisms that led to behavior change. And one of the things you'd mentioned is that when you're looking at the mechanisms, one of the things you saw was that the pricing mechanism really was way down at the bottom and that all these other environmental motivations and everything else was, was much higher. And, and I, I want to ask kind of t two questions about that. Uh, first of all, have, did you see how any heterogeneity in this? Have you done this many times with different studies? And part of the reason I ask this is because I've asked similar questions of people in the context of, of Connecticut with solar energy where it really depends on which audience you're talking to um, because many of the audiences actually pricing is, is way at the top and other audiences that happen to be very environmental communities uh, tend to have these other motivations much higher. And so one question is, is the heterogeneity question? Um, and the second is, uh, do you see this as, do you see any trends in this if you've done this multiple times? Or do you see this, like, do, do people learn or do people change how they, they're viewing uh, the motivations behind what they're doing after, they say, they've done a lot of programs, they get tired uh, of, of these programs? Um, how do these motivations evolve? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> those, are, those are great questions. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I like to refer to a, 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 a meta-analysis of feedback studies on uh, price information and the effect of um, the benefit, pricing benefit of reducing energy. This is by Del Moss from UCLA, and she found that on average, information on how much money you can save produces a net increase in energy usage because energy is so uh, cheap. And so I would not based on my work, we found that across the board, saving money um, and how much in prize and incentives was very, very low on our list of priorities in our programs. But I've, I've spoken with other people in other sectors, as you mentioned, for example, some colleagues who work in uh, Nicaragua, where just the information of how much money they're, they're spending it, they're willing to pay for that information because it's so valuable for them. So yes, I think particularly for lower income communities uh, where energy is a much higher portion of their total budget than it's the, it's the thing, and for, for, for businesses as well. In our programs though, um, you know, it definitely ranked lower on the list to the kind of the higher order motivations, which really goes to the second um, question, which is, you know, seeing trends over time, we've run these programs um, a cool California challenge over three years. And you know, very quickly, a lot of people um, identify themselves as someone who's kind of done everything already. And, and you know, so they engage year after year, what's the, really the benefit? Well, the benefit really goes to the core motivation, and I think it goes beyond this helping your community. It's this feeling of self-efficacy. It's this feeling that we are doing something that's greater than ourselves. And so they start to engage in their community. They start to engage at that next higher order from household to interpersonal communication to organization to community. And, and I, I, I feel, at least anecdotally, um, that, that kind of we, 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 calc we give people different levels. And at the highest level, you're a guru. And I, I have this feeling that the gurus are really leading and pulling a lot of people along with them. And so the longevity of these programs is really important. Usually they're just pilots, and they, you run them, and they, run, they, they go away. But it's just like a business, and you get better and better and better and better over time. And I really think you need to stick with them. So thank you for those questions. Uh, hi, uh, this is Tom Bowling. Chris, why don't you stay up there? I got a question for you first. Um, I am an architect, and I have, uh, with a team, uh, certified 55 buildings in Dubai. And uh, it was an interesting experience, and I learned a lot about uh, existing buildings and new buildings in, in, in terms of uh, LEED certification uh, and also uh, just how hard it is to certify existing buildings. <laughs> it is very difficult, and um, it is difficult to change existing buildings, but that is a, our biggest problem across the world, actually. And um, my, my my question to you, Chris, in, in terms of your discussion, you were talking about um, um, different efficiencies in, in terms of uh, making uh, a dent in the uh, global warming. Uh, one of the things that I've become aware of is a, a plant-based eating diet, and that uh, makes a big difference in your carbon footprint individually. And that's one thing that everybody can actually look at. 
Uh, that's a, I know that's a big factor that's uh, hardly talked about. <laughs> it's a shame. So, and, uh, yeah. so that's, that was my question to you. Uh, Globally right now, food uh, contributes more to greenhouse gas emissions if you include deforestation than transportation. And that is what the California footprint will look like in 2050 if, if we meet all of our goals. Food is going to be the largest source of, of emissions. And uh, we uh, waste about 30% um, of our food. Uh, we overeat by about 25%. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the big ones. And then from there, really uh, switching from a meat uh, to a plant-based diet can have tremendous benefits, not only for our health, uh, which is going to be one of the main motivations, but um, uh, for the planet. And we, we really have to do that. It, it's unfortunate. We, we have very aggressive uh, scenarios for agricultural Im efficiency improvements. And even with those, without addressing diet, um, we're, when we don't have policies, there's no money for this. But there's a billion dollars in energy efficiency in California uh, for, you know, but where's the money? It, transportation is much lower than that. Where's the money for, for diet? It needs to be, it's important. Thank you for bringing it up. Also, I had a question for- oh, One other thing, it, it connects with people on an emotional level. Food is so important to us as human beings that it's a great way to connect with people. Yeah. Thanks. I had a question for Mike in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the parts per million levels that we've been talking about in, in your discussion. Um, you mentioned uh, a level of, I think it's 450 of, is where the world is now. Um, no, a little over 400. Yeah, a little over 400. Mm -hmm. I remember just a few years ago as we talked about 360. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as a matter of fact, that was supposed to be the tipping point. Mm -hmm. Now, how does that tipping point relate to wh where we're at today? That's probably a question better answered by somebody in the room who's actually got a background in climate science, which I don't have. Um, I know that there are people who are saying we need to be well below um, 450, even below 400, and so they're looking at ways to very aggressively decarbonize the atmosphere, not just what we put out, you know, de novo in energy. But um, how the science has been moving in terms of the tipping points, I'm not an expert on that. I take it as what comes out in the analyses of targets. Anybody? Got something on that? All right, we didn't get a climate scientist into the room. I'm sorry. Uh, so this is a question for you, Mike, so don't sit down yet. Uh, uh, that, that was a terrific presentation, though, though a bit grim, perhaps, but, <laughs> but uh, I expected nothing less. Uh, so, so, so I have a couple questions. One has to do with the role of the UNFCCC and the whole COP process in R&D. You spoke about the importance of R&D building and what Ken said and others have said uh, today, and uh, critically important. Uh, and I'm wondering um, what your view is on what, as if there are initiatives uh, uh, to increase uh, R&D dramatically, public R&D, as, as Ken discussed and you discussed a little bit, uh, to what extent should we try to either uh, incorporate those within the UNFCCC process or insulate them from the UNFCCC process? I sort of lean towards the latter, but curious for your views on that. Yeah. And related to that, if we are gonna move ahead on sort of looking hard at geoengineering, What's the role of the UNFCCC in that? Mm -hmm. And then the third question is whether you have any thoughts on innovative approaches to R&D uh, that would help us spend this money uh, productively and efficiently. Clearly, opening the spigot, more money can lead to more things, but it can also lead to more waste. So yeah. there are there smart things we can be doing that, that you might want to tell us about? Okay. Uh, I would have expected nothing less than three good questions from you, so thank you. Um, so uh, I think I'm with you on wanting to see this technology club not be a part of the UNFCCC process. Whatever its virtues as a United Nations rooted process with a lot of inclusiveness, it also has a lot of problems with that and I think that there has to be a, a, an approach that gets a smaller and more manageable number of people into the room to figure out how to do that. Um, jumping to the third question, um, there are certainly people in 
our field of economics and in other fields that know a lot more about that than I do, and so I'll frankly admit that. But I think that there are ways that we can try to improve the competitiveness of funding allocation, uh, improve the quality of peer review. But at the same time, some things have to be like moonshots. Some things have to be, you know, attempting the, the unexpected or the, the dubious in order to make sure that you've covered the whole uh, the whole range. So I agree that's a complicated problem, and I don't think I have anything more than a couple of lame sentences to say about it, but you're absolutely right to highlight it. On geoengineering, um, that's something that I was thinking about a few years ago, so I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, there are, you know, two sides to it. One is how to do it, and one is how to govern it. And I think that it's going to be very difficult to avoid serious international conflict unless we find some way of governing it internationally. Now, maybe that's not the UNFCCC, maybe it's some other part of the UN, maybe it's you know, some other setting, I'm not sure. But there will be a lot of stakeholders that will have ancillary effects from geoengineering, and they may not be the ones in the room discussing how it should be done and you know, the pros and cons of different approaches but they will be affected by it nonetheless. So there has to be some way of dealing with that. One way to start would be to try to have some kind of convention on radiation management, a very simple, you know, sort of one goal one, which is to try to characterize the conditions under which you, you could use it, rather than trying to figure out in extremis what the last resort means and is it time for the last resort. Um, I don't have any you know, way of saying what that ought to be, but I think it's something that ought to be talked about. But I think as far as the sort of scrutiny of pros and cons of specific approaches to doing it, again, that requires a high level of technical ability. I think that discussion can happen amongst the more technically advanced countries, but it can't happen kind of isolated from the recognition that there's a, a global stake in how well or how poorly geoengineering gets done if it, if it does get done. This is for Chris. Um, Chris, early in your talk, you showed a plot of all the things that happened to happen to get to 80% reduction in carbon dioxide emissions. And one of those steps was electrification of space heating. I've seen that in other analyses as well. Um, could you remind us why that's important and how you imagine that happening over the next 35 years? <clears throat> Fantastic question on uh, electrification of space heating. Um, well, basically, the emissions from agriculture and high industri industry processes of high heating uh, alone and some high um, emission gases alone are, are, are basically going to be the 20% that we can't reduce. And so we have to essentially eliminate fossil fuels. Uh, and in California, um, that means uh, phasing out natural gas starting now. There's a lot of resistance in, in policy. There's some real, we have some utilities that are just natural gas utilities. And so we have to get rid of them, at least on our modeling. From what we can tell, we don't see any other way to do it, uh, just because you have those other high emission sources that you can't get rid of very easily. And so that means um, because of the turnover of you put install something today, a portion of them will still be here in 2050. So you need to start phasing them out now. And there's some real cost-effective advantages. Uh, going to your second point, if you're building a new, and, and David's point also, if you're building a new community, just don't install the natural gas at all, and you're going to have some cost savings there. Uh, the important point, though, is that uh, heat pumps are very efficient. You, you put one unit of energy in, and you get between two and three units of energy out. And so there, um, even in cold climates, uh, there are new technologies and some that are kind of on the cutting edge that are uh, even efficient in cold climates. So, you know, heat pumps are kind of, they're more expensive. Um, this is a, a costly feature, but it's not one that you can kind of wait and do later. Um, you have, it's one of these high cost things that you got to do and start doing it now. Another thing I want to say on, the, on natural gas is that we have this wonderful um, policy, zero net energy building policy code in California. It's going to be phased in. It's fantastic. 
but most of the buildings are have natural gas heating and with enough renewable energy to offset on an energy basis the 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 you know natural gas but in 2050 that pv will no longer be offsetting any carbon because your grid is going to be so the benefits of that on a carbon basis go down over time and so um, we really need zero net carbon uh, code. And there's a lot of discussion about that in California about how to do that and implement it. And it should include uh, transportation as well. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, I think it's an important thing to do. 